Hello, this time looking at question three from the recent exam paper, the one about frequency responses. There is almost always a question about frequency responses in previous uh, exam papers, and this is likely to continue. It's such an important subject. This time we have got a second order system. You can tell it's second order because it's got both an inductor and a capacitor in it. First bit of the question, as usual, a bit of bookwork. What is meant by the resonant frequency and Q factor? There's only two marks available, so I'm only looking for two points in the answer. So almost anything sensible would do. You could, for example, note that the um, standard form of a second order response has this equation and point out that that is the definition of Q factor and resonant frequency. That would be fine. You could also point out that the resonant frequency is the frequency at which the impedance of the inductor and the impedance of the capacitor cancel each other out. One is positive imaginary, the other is negative imaginary. At this particular frequency they have a net zero effect. That would be a reasonable definition of resonant frequency as well. Um, you could also point out that this is a bandpass filter, if you could remember that the configuration that we have here with the output being taken across the resistor is a bandpass filter, and point out that the resonant frequency is the frequency of maximum gain of this system. That would do. Um, you could point out that for the Q factor, the Q factor is the gain at the resonant frequency for the high pass or the low pass configuration. Uh, that would also do. Basically, almost any two points that you make, uh, if as long as they are accurate, would get these two marks. Right, moving on to the second part of the question, and we actually have a network to analyse. Okay, derive the frequency response and determine the location of all poles and zeros. Well, standard type of problem. Here we have an inductor a capacitor and a resistor in series with the output being taken across the resistor. It's a potential divider. Again, we have the V in here, we have a network there, which actually is composed of the inductor and the capacitor in series. We have a network down here, which is just the resistor, and the output is being taken across that point there, down to ground. The impedance of this uh, thing here, this network, is a inductor in series with a capacitor, so that would be J omega L plus 1 over J omega C. The impedance of this component is a resistor, so that's just R. So apply the standard potential divider equation, and we would get V out over V in equals R over R plus J omega L plus 1 over J omega C. Um, and that is the frequency response. That is what we term hj of omega, the output divided by the input. Right, now this is not in the standard form that we're looking for, uh, because we've got this term 1 over j omega c. And what we need is to get both the numerator here and the denominator in the form of a polynomials in j omega. So the terms either don't have any j omegas in them, or they're j omega, or j omega squared, or j omega cubed, that kind of thing. And we've got a term here in 1 over j omega. Need to get rid of that. And the easiest way to do that is just to multiply up by whatever, whatever is underneath this term. So multiply top and bottom here by j omega c, and this 1 over j omega c would just become 1. So, multiply top and bottom by j omega c, and we would get j omega c times r all over j omega c times r plus j omega squared lc plus 1. And we can rearrange that into what might be a slightly more familiar form, j omega rc over 1 plus j omega rc plus j omega squared times LC. Now, we're trying to get this into the standard form of a frequency response. 
And for a second order system, the standard form that you might remember is this one. Again, j omega to the power of n, where n is the number of zeros at zero hertz. 1 plus j omega, that's a zero. And there may be other zeros as well, and so on. Divided by all of the poles. The first pole, the second pole, and any other poles that there might be. Uh, when we have a second order system, either two zeros or two poles, we often don't use this form. We use another form which is well worth knowing. And that's the form that I put up here. Expressing the denominator in that form gives me hj of omega g times this um, n and then any zeros that we might have over 1 plus j omega over q omega naught plus j omega squared over omega naught squared. And it's well worth knowing that equi equivalent form for a second order system. Right, now we've got to try and express the frequency response that we actually got in these terms. And the frequency response that we got is this one up here. And just by comparing this form with this form, we can note that, well, n, big N, must be 1, because we've got a j omega, but only a single j omega. It's not j omega squared, uh, but there is one j omega there, so n is 1. That means that I have one zero at zero hertz. Um, there are no other zeros on the top. There's no term at the top that looks anything like this. So we have no other zeros at the top. We do have a gain, gain CR. On the bottom, we have 1 plus j omega CR here. So that tells us that 1 over q omega naught is CR. And here we have j omega squared LC. The standard form is j omega squared over omega naught squared. So that tells us that 1 over omega naught squared is LC. And we could work out what the resonant frequency and the Q factor are from these two terms. However, that's not what the question asks for. It doesn't ask for the resonant frequency or the Q factor. It asks for the locations of the poles and zeros in the frequency response. You could work out the resonant frequency and the Q factor and then apply the standard formula to work out the poles in terms of the resonant frequency and the Q factor. But you may not remember that standard formula, so you may prefer to do it a slightly different way. And that is to use the rather easier to remember fact that the pole frequencies are minus one times the roots of the polynomial. Now, we, what the polynomial that we had was 1 plus j omega cr plus j omega squared lc. And if we want to find the roots of that expression, we put that equal to 0 and work out what values of j omega make this expression true. Those are the roots of this equation. And as I said, the poles are minus 1 times those roots. So, how do you work out the roots? Well, it's a quadratic equation. If I expressed it in perhaps a slightly more familiar form, um, j omega squared times LC plus j omega times CR plus 1 equals 0, that is in the standard form of x squared times A plus x times B plus C equals 0. The standard quadratic equation works just fine. The roots of this, um, I'll call them R, would be given by minus b, which is minus cr, 
plus or minus the square root of b squared, cr squared, minus 4 times a, that's lc, times c, that's just 1, all over 2a, 2 times lc. And you really should know the quadratic equation by now. If not, make sure you do. Now these are the roots of the equation. Bear in mind that the poles are minus 1 times the roots, so the poles would be minus 1 times this. I could just write that as CR plus or minus CR squared minus 4LC over 2LC. I guess, strictly speaking, I, might, I should have written minus plus there, because minus CR plus this becomes plus CR minus this when you multiply it by minus 1, but who cares? It's going to be plus and minus either way. We're going to get two roots, so I'll just write it like this. Um, now it's time to put in some numbers. Pole equals the capacitor is... 10 nanofarads, the resistor is 2k2, plus or minus the square root of 10 nano times 2k2 squared, minus 4 times the inductor, which is 100 micro, times the capacitor 10 nano, divided by 2 times the inductor, 100 micro, times the capacitor 10 nano. Right, now we need to get out the calculators. 10 nano is 10 e to the minus 9 times 2k2. That is 2.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Plus or minus. Okay, next term. The square root of 2.2 times 10 to the minus 5. That's the, the CR that I've just calculated. Um, squared minus 4 times 100 microfarads, sorry, 100 microhenries, times 10 nanofarads. That gives me 2.191 times 10 to the minus 5, divided by... 2 times 100 microhenries times 10 nanofarads, 2 times 10 to the minus 12. And that gives me, well, 2.2e to the minus 5 plus 2.191e to the minus 5 divided by 2e to the minus 12. 21, actually 21.96 mega, and this is radians per second at the moment, because it's a J omega term. Omega is always a natural frequency in radians per second, not a frequency in hertz. Uh, and the other one is 2.2, that becomes a minus in there. And that works out to be, um, let's see, but that would be 45 kiloradians per second. And if I wanted to express those in terms of hertz, I would just take them and divide by 2 pi. That gives me about 3.5 megahertz and approximately. This one, seven, round about 7.2 kilohertz or so. Close enough. Right, so I've got two poles, one at 3.5 megahertz, one at 7.2 kilohertz, and don't forget I've also got the zero at zero hertz, because the numerator of the frequency response, this one up here, had a j omega in it. n was 1. So there's a 0 at 0 hertz, there's a pole at 3.5 megahertz, and there's another pole at 7.2 kilohertz. And 
that's it. Ten marks. As I say, there's no real need to learn any complicated formulas, but you will need to use the um, quadratic equation if you've got a second order system and you can't remember the equation for getting poles from the resonant frequency and the Q factor. Um, right, end of part B, and all I have time for in this first video. I will carry on with the next one. See you in part two.